for everyone who's arrived, thank you very much. This is our weekly California Thoracic Society surge meeting that was started in January when everything was hitting the fan. And we thought it would be great for us to all connect uh, so that we could stay out of crisis. We've talked about oxygen issues, uh, anticoagulation for COVID, talking about troubleshooting things when we ran out of supplies and sterile water, ventilator issues. And today's our final session as a surge conversation, although CTS will be continuing these conversations on a twice a month basis. And we'd like to do a, a debrief. Um, we've all been hearing about the impact that all of the surge and COVID has had on all of us on the front lines and you guys are more on that than anyone. And so we thought we'd talk about lessons learned and have uh, a more of a conversation about that tonight. We thank, as always, Fisher Pay, Cal, SmartVest, and Voxen for making this platform available to us. And we thank Vicki and the team at CTS, Phil and Dave Eubanks as well. Thank you all. So when we first started, I thought I'd add some levity to this, but we were facing uh, crisis standards of care and allocation of scarce resources. Who gets what if we run out? Um, when we had put all of this together. And as with our weekly meetings, we this is what Crisis Cares Foundation was supposed to be, where there's a federal oversight, local and state governments, hospitals, public health, emergency management, and per continuous process improvement, information sharing, provider engagement, just this whole foundation was supposed to work together. I got this uh, a few days ago and regarding just the vaccine implementation. And this is what it is currently feeling like to our providers and, and users, the patients, that when things don't aren't working smoothly together, the fragmented system um, makes it a very difficult challenge and for providers as well as the patients. And sometimes in disaster situations, this, this is what it feels like. And so this is, um, how can we make things better? Our ICU status right now, um, this is a good opportunity for us to reflect and, and start thinking about process improvement. Uh, beds, ICU beds are more available compared to last week. Um, our death toll is decreasing very slightly, but it is on the right, right trend. And we have um, started to improve our vaccination efforts a little bit slowly. So with that, Denny and Christian, I pass the mic to you for this weekly status. Well, since I wasn't on NPR uh, this week, I, I like Christian, I'll, I'll start, and he can uh, he can pontificate. Uh, <laughs> we, we reflect uh, uh, the statistics that you just shown, uh, Asha, and we what we've done is since our we have a model that's been tracking pretty well. As a matter of fact, we're we're sitting right now just a little over a hundred a uh, hundred patients that are COVID in the, in our our Scripps community in our hospitals, uh, and uh, about 40 or 50 in the ICU of the, um, among them about 90% are intubated still. So we still have that going. Our modeling suggests that we now are sitting about the same place we were in early November uh, and on the downturn. Uh, we maxed it in January, mid January at 510 uh, uh, COVID patients in, in our system. And, uh, and the model looks like there might be a small uptick the uptick in uh, in about mid March, but a very small bump that we're expecting. So we're we're still you know we're optimistic. Uh, uh, most of ours are now the chronic uh, COVID patients, chronic ventilated, plus or minus uh, tracheostomy or not. But uh, 
we're, uh, we reflect exactly what you showed, Asha. How about you, Christian? Yeah, it's, you know, Denny, exactly the same. And if anybody else is from the northern side, uh, please chime in if you have different data. Um, numbers trending, obviously, downward, which is great. Uh, we have um, some of the subset numbers we have, um, which, which was reported in the New York Times, I think yesterday, the day before, we've seen a pretty nice drop in our nursing home admissions with COVID. So as um, those patients get vaccinated, I'm not sure if that's the sole reason or if uh, they have have better protection or a combination of each. We think actually vaccinations playing a role, but that's trended downward, which is a nice trend. Um, as far as our ECMO, we're up two, but that has nothing to do with COVID. So we decannulated one, cannulated three people in the last week, uh, but that's really all non-COVID, which is great. Um, so that part's been um, pretty good. And so overall, we're trending downward. Our numbers look pretty much what you showed, Asha, which is great. And uh, we did tabletop um, twice this past week, crisis standards of care. And we know it's getting good when our CMO and our Dean say, do we really have to do this? You know, it's painful when they say that, but it's like, you know, then they're like, I don't know if we'll ever need this. Um, but we slapped them right and got things going. So that's good. And uh, uh, tabletop that, which was, which was good. It was a good experience. So um, anyway, I think we're, yeah, we're in a good place right now. So that's, uh, that's helpful. And anyone else from the Northern side, if you have other data, that would be great. We've been pretty consistently, uh, even across the state. Our transfers for COVID have gone down as well, which I didn't mention. Elon, do you wanna tell us what's up at Sharp? Um, yeah, I was trying to pull up the numbers from uh, Tom Laurie, but I think uh, the numbers here at Sharp, um, you know, really mirror what everyone else, uh, probably at UCSD and Scripps have been seeing where the numbers are coming way down overall and now, most of our ICU patients are non-COVID. Wonderful, and you also had a question regarding MOAB, so we'll, um, that may be a, something to talk about in terms of its effectiveness. Um, personally, I found it effective early on, um, but I think the data on the dual combo treatments are better, but I don't know if anybody has access to them, so that would be interesting. George Show, I see you're on the line. Do you wanna tell us what's going on in LA? In LA, sure, happy to. Uh, similar uh, downtrend in the number of patients in the hospital. We've gone down from having five ICU teams down to three now, and we just phase one out today. So um, we're down to about um, between 45 to 50 active COVID patients in the ICU. Um, which is still a lot, but uh, it represents only about, um, actually that's for the whole hospital. That represents only about 20% of our ICU population right now, which has been growing with other activity. And then, uh, but our COVID recovered, quote unquote recovered, is still fairly high. It's under hundred now, but it's still in the nineties. And, you know, we're struggling with dealing with those patients now, some of whom are still on ventilators, still on dialysis, still having a lot of uh, comorbidities and multi-organ system failure, but certainly a lot better than it was. How's the East Coast, Carla? Uh, our numbers, at least in the hospital, are going down and statewide. The numbers are going down. More people are getting their vaccines. Uh, uh, slowly but surely, they're happening. And we're down to have, we have like 23 COVID positive ICU patients now, which is coming down. So we're happy about that. How about Tisha? Um, how's UCLA? Um, yeah, we're in pretty good shape, actually. We have um, 30 active COVID patients, about half of them are in the ICU. Um, that's not counting all the COVID recovered, so that probably is at least another 30 or so. Um, but we're in good shape, actually. We don't have any more surge teams as of this week. Everybody Thanks. looks good. That's, that's the way we want to go. We wish we could keep it that way. That's be the nice thing. Exactly, exactly. So it's a perfect time to kind of unwind. I guess I, I, I already said I can't uh, I can't drink wine for another how long uh, Charlotte another 45 minutes I'm <laughs> off the clock yep you've got about 45 minutes because we've already had four admissions since you left <laughs> not COVID right just yeah. one all right well I, so, we're going to wax a little bit and then uh, I understand we're going to talk a little bit about how to how to get through this and I I I most of you don't know me I, I I'm old I've been around I'm a little long in the tooth uh, but uh, I guess the the four things that I'm going to just 
mention is that, you know, besides that I'm old, is that I told you so. I told you so that this would happen. And uh, I've got the proof of it. Uh, and, and then uh, I got it and I'm done, I think is, uh, is, is all I wanna talk about. Uh, Asha, if you can move ahead. I just, I, I graduated in 1976 from medical school and spent 38 years in the Navy. And, and now I'm uh, 13 years with the script system. So many of you maybe have been there, but I, I, I've seen initially HIV as a deadly disease. I, I trained in, uh, up in uh, San Francisco General, 79 to 82, uh, did some work up there just during HIV and hantavirus and then SARS. And then I watched HIV become a chronic disease uh, over the years versus that deadly disease that we saw with Slim Man's disease up in, up in the uh, Bay Area. I've seen Zika, Ebola, I'll talk about. I was in Liberia for Ebola. And now COVID-19 all in my lifetime. I, I'm not sure I, I would have uh, known that for sure. I, I, I do have a master's degree in disaster medicine and, and global health. And I've been to Bandachi tsunami and the Yoga Garda, Yoga Garda, Indonesia's earthquake. The same time Mount Merapi erupted and I stayed there for that. And it just erupted again, by the way. Uh, some of you may remember 1979 in San Diego, the uh, influenza epidemic. It was just, it wasn't a pandemic, but it was epidemic and it occurred just before the holiday season when, when uh, and everything was on a Wednesday. So the offices closed on Tuesday, didn't open on, on, uh, on Wednesday, Thursday or Friday through the weekend. And we had, uh, we had our epidemic uh, here and we, were, we ran out of ventilators. We went to LA for ventilators. We borrowed from the Navy at that time. We were buying ventilators, putting them together while people were being bagged in the hallways during that time. It was, uh, it was as close to a war zone as, uh, as I've been. Uh, Ebola, I ended my career in the Navy uh, at, in the Haiti earthquake response and spent a couple months on the uh, USNS Comfort uh, running their ICU. Now I have COVID. Uh, I've been in Iraq, Afghanistan, Southern Philippines, and North Africa during war zones. And I, I've personally had dengue, shigella, entamoeba, histolytica, and Hep C and had to take that uh, had to take that damn uh, shot every every weekend on Friday and suffered for the week. But um, most of all, what I have is I, I've had the honor to teach really great physicians. Uh, some of our speakers and Carla, uh, Asha, of course, and uh, it's been incredible times. Next slide. Uh, um, so I told you, I told you so, and uh, because I have, I've been, I taught. Uh, disaster medicine at the Graduate School of Public Health here in San Diego, and I've been thinking about this topic for years, as has Asha. Uh, and in 2015, I had the honor of addressing the California Thoracic Society at their annual meeting uh, uh, as their uh, dinner keynote speaker. And some of you might have been there and remember the subject, which uh, is the next slide, which was care in the age of the super virus and who would win. And, I kind of talked about uh, some cases, Asha. Next slide, yeah. So this was a personal uh, case of mine. I was on a United Airlines flight from Russia to Dakar uh, when I heard there was a doctor on board. And I, I, I would tell you, I, all these things ran through my mind, but I hadn't had my first gin and tonic yet. So I, I, uh, I, I made the, uh, I notified the flight attendant and spent uh, four hours with a uh, very sweaty uh, uh, African lady who uh, went out and I was the only person in that row uh, because everybody else was hiding uh, because they were sure it was, uh, was Ebola. Next slide. Some of you might remember that time. It was, it was, this is what greeted us when we came back from Liberia, that left upper uh, picture uh, you get greeted at the airport and get your temperature taken and then and then get go through a screen as you come back in the United States. Uh, you can go on, you can go on for there. Another slide. Uh, what I was doing in Ebola was uh, helping out at one of the Ebola treatment units uh, uh, built by the DoD and run by the NIH uh, there, but I was also helping field some of the. Uh, of the one more slide, Asha. 
uh, at uh, Redemption Hospital in downtown Liberia, where uh, where it actually all started there, and we were trying to do some uh, some vaccine development in that, and it was uh, it was interesting times, uh, and I thought this would be my last hurrah with uh, with something that could kill you and be around you, but I was wrong. Uh, next slide. Uh, we also talked at that same uh, same talk about one of these new things that we were seeing overseas, but we really didn't know what it was. And by gosh, uh, you know, we were, I gave them a couple things to do. And what would you do for that person? Next slide. Yeah, uh, it was a coronavirus. And uh, we talked about SARS in 2003. And we talked about this novel virus back in 2015 and how it's, uh, what its mortality was. And, and I, I would tell you that I, I thought, you know, I was given this talk and I thought I would never have to worry about coronavirus, to be honest with you. Next slide. So I, we, I you know, we kind of figured out what it was. Uh, at, we, at SARS, we developed something. It, it was mostly uh, in Canada at the time. And uh, the second uh, COVID arrived and I, we now know so much more about this bug, uh, but we're still behind. Next slide. So I, I posited this, you know, what do you see as the greatest uh, uh, super virus threat to the, uh, to the world? And, uh, you know, I, most of the people wanted that pandemic, highly pathogenic influenza virus. Uh, and I don't know, uh, I, maybe we've answered that. I guess I hope we've answered that with the novel coronavirus, because maybe we can get on top of it. Uh, next slide. But I'm a, I'm my Norwegian farmer uh, genes come through and I keep waiting for the shoe to drop for that, that zombie virus to show up. So we'll, we'll see. Next slide. So uh, I hope, I hope D is not the answer. Uh, you know, I, I doubt if we'll migrate to another planet, but uh, maybe that B thing will help us as we, as we advance. I, I, I sure hope it is. Next slide. Uh, I, I don't know uh, what the prediction will be. I'm going to leave that to you guys because uh, I'm going to I'm going to blow town here in a little bit. Next slide. So my personal experience was I, I did get COVID, and uh, October 25th this year, I lost my sense of smell and taste, and and started coughing. Two days later, my wife, uh, uh, who's an infectious disease doc, by the way, uh, who does uh, public health, uh, developed a shortness of breath lost her voice and, and just began with exuberant coughing. I ended up uh, spending two weeks on, on home on oxygen and 20 days, two, two courses of Decadron. I put on 10 pounds, which I can't get off and, uh, and spent six weeks off work uh, for me. My wife spent 27 days hospitalized, 11 in the ICU on 90 to 100% high flow, uh, extremely deconditioned, extremely uh, 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 debilitated and remains significantly impaired. She's home now, she's getting outpatient rehabilitation, but uh, that totally changed my paradigm. Uh, I, I, the big elephant in the room was I gave it to her and I, I certainly am an advocate for uh, spouses and, and, uh, and family members uh, getting being on that vaccine list because uh, it, it clearly was, uh, was me. Uh, giving it to her. Next slide. So, you know, I'm, I'm done. I, I turned 71 in September. I have six kids, nine grandkids. I got to spoil. I want to be around to do that. I got a place uh, up north to putter in and I got a wife to make up to. So after about 50 years, I'm leaving scripts in good hands. And from what I've seen from this, this Friday night uh, uh, talk, there are a lot of extremely smart people uh, in California. And there are a lot of extremely part, smart people doing good things like you guys are. So I, I think you guys are going to be in, uh, uh, great. And I, I wouldn't do a thing different. And I just appreciate the opportunity to say how, how uh, blessed I am to, to be able to be on these calls and see, see these smart people thinking about uh, coronavirus. I think that's it, Asha. Yeah. Wow. Thank you very much. And um, I, I have to say that 
what you put together in 15 minutes doesn't even reflect the breadth of your career and the impact you've had on pulmonary medicine. Um, so we thank you. I'm sure Carla echoes the same thing. Um, so our next slide, our next spot is for Christian to share kind of some lessons learned or reflections of your experience. Yeah, well, it's hard to follow Denny because, man, you have done everything and been all over. So it's uh, it's always great hearing your stories, which I remember over the years. And that was sort of my favorite part of the chess meetings is hanging out with Denny and hearing what's going on. Because um, in a good way, you made my life seem boring. And I like that hearing how great all the great things you've done and been a great mentor. So hard to follow that for sure. Um, and my reflections won't be anything near as uh, great and um, things that have sort of happened. I wanted to just talk a little bit about what I noticed um, now that we're sort of in it and um, been in it for a while um, and the issues that I think still will be a problem at going forward. And that's really my key is we've done some things well um, from the beginning. We've done some things that we didn't do well in the beginning, but corrected. And uh, but I do see these things as problems still going forward, which I'd like to correct. Um, in some way, and all the great people on this call would probably uh, hopefully um, have some structure to help me with this. Um, one is the regional support and planning. I think that has been one of the most disheartening things, and I'd love to hear your feedback um, and your experiences, particularly in Southern California, where, you know, we just, you know, I still feel like an island. You know, we're a standalone academic center. We have some partner hospitals, which are preferred partners, but we don't control them, and we obviously are trying to take their transfers up to our facility, uh, but it really leaves us very limited with how we um, sort of can manage the region. And it's just been unbelievable seeing all the vying for resources, working hard for resources. I know that, for example, our CEO is on multiple other calls with regional CEOs, but um, it is just difficult to guess this regional support and planning. And when we go to the MOAC and the regional, um, you know, regional groups that are supposed to do this planning. Um, it's just been sometimes crickets or they don't quite have the experience that we all have on hospital management. So I think that's really been really the most difficult, I would say. Um, individual people, they've been great. As my colleagues call me from around Northern California, we try to solve problems, that's great. We run into the issue of figuring out how to ch share and plan. And I would love to see that regional support uh, work better. I know Denny and I have talked about this and you know, we would get calls from Imperial County to take patients and transfer, you know, and that happened regularly through December and January. And, you know, we would love to do this, but there just seemed to be this desperation, you know, calls from, you know, Salt Lake City, Las Vegas, um, Arizona, really just looking to have patients come to our facility because they were overfilled just like we were. So having that planning would have been great. And then having that communication, I think starting this call is fantastic. And that's really worked with a lot of communication across the specialties. But I know from the UC standpoint, from a few of the calls I've been on from the UCOP perspective and just uh, my colleagues on other calls, um, that's actually really been a great help. But having that communication out um, cross outside of of academics and into other non-academic facilities and non-academic specialties I think would be key. So how do we reach out to all the people not on this call and all the other critical care and other specialists are gonna handle this I think would be great. Um, how to handle mixed messages. So I would say that's been a big issue for us. So, um, you know, when we saw this early on with masking being a mixed message that has gone forward extensively, we're still dealing with masking issues because, um, you know, despite how much PPE we have, we're still having many of our, our workers wanting two masks on. So you know, that's a beautiful example of how we handle all these mixed messages from, you know, vaccination all the way through the medications we use. And then the last is some sort of need for urgent adjudication. So when we're stuck, and I know um, Asha and Denny are, are very strong experts in this with allocation of scarce resources, uh, but when we're stuck and not even quite in crisis standards of care, we notice this difficulty with um, adjudicating some of our resources and facilities, our resources and in, uh, work internally. And you know, an example might be, hey, we can run this patient to the OR and do an elective case, or we can take this transfer, this ECMO case and transfer. And um, you know, the discussion would be so long that in the end, we wouldn't do either. So we would miss the opportunity to get this person in the OR, we wouldn't take this patient and transfer, and then we really did neither of them. And this need to quickly have some decision from the top. And for those of you who are trained in the military, that would be wonderful because we would have loved some sort of marching orders to say, we're doing this. This is our mission. This is our plan. Here's where we're going. And I think very often, particularly when we were taking care of these patients, we weren't really sure, you know, are we still at, you know, is 
we're going to take care of our patients, but can we actually take these patients and transfer? Or is our leadership and everyone else still interested in pushing forward with as much surgery and as many cases as we want? And I think that need for urgent adjudication was felt in many of the regional hospitals with you know all of our former fellows as we get together. They had the same issues in their facility and it became something that was hard to manage. Um, so anyway, just my, my few thoughts on our experiences and I'd love to hear what Asha has to say. And um, Denny, I love your stories. They're always good. Um, any flight out of Russia would always worry me. I flew Aeroflot once and I'll never do it again. So I took a flight out of Rwanda on a plane that was about 75 years old um, and more recently took a flight out of Iran on a Boeing 717 that the only country they're legal to fly in is Iran. Um, and I'd almost be worried to fly out of Russia. So <laughs> brave, brave flights. Well, thanks, Christian. And, and again, Danny, it, it's gonna be hard to follow both of you. Um, but I had just a couple of thoughts. Now, just keep in mind, I'm in the outpatient doc who's responded with disasters, um, not quite as many as Denny has, but at, in the alternate care sites and just doing my part to keep people out of the ICUs. Um, some of the things that I feel um, would have been better is I wish we would have started these calls earlier uh, because there was a lot of differing information coming through from multiple venues, whether academics, uh, literature. And I noticed every hospital system was trying to assimilate this literature and turn it into protocols. And in, in, in the outpatient arena, we really had nothing. And it would have been great if we could have initiated these, streamlined some, uh, organize them better so that we could all have a similar standard of care. Um, I also noticed that when things are hitting the fan, we get more entrenched in rigid systems so that there's less um, ability to pivot. It's like you, if you can keep things going as normal as possible, um, then you must be okay However, those are not, those are inflexible and sometimes people tended to just stay in their lane and when you're in a crisis or trying to avoid crisis, you need to be a little bit more flexible. Um, also, moral injury, I, it was hard for me to witness uh, that there were folks getting pay cuts in pulmonary critical care and emergency medicine and I think many of us uh, reading about that, uh, our hearts were breaking um, when we knew everybody was putting their lives at risk. And I think ev all of us going to work felt that until we received the vaccine. Lack of PPE, and we're still in a lack of PPE situation. Why at a year out is a, a big question. And I think that needs to be answered for us to all feel confident. Uh, Fragmented and rapidly changing policies, as Christian alluded to, uh, I think contributes to a lot of what we experience um, and stress. Lack of cohesive communication within the profession may also contribute to that. Um, we really didn't have time for reflection, mourning, processing. I lost a relative, a grand, my grandmother, to COVID when there were no treatments last summer during um, the surge in Irvine. And, um, and then right after that, my father and we just, and then right after that, we're preparing for our surge. And so there's just, I think we've also dealt with a lot as a profession. In addition, Denny, you dealt with it personally. So I know you're still kind of going through that um, processing. And then we kept our doors open, I, me and my pulmonary practice and many people segued to telemedicine. I became the front line for a lot. I was a gastroenterologist in ENT and, and, and I think that's gonna, um, that was an interesting uh, shift at that point, but I just um, put it out there because we were facing a lot of questions and uh, carrying a lot on our shoulders. And, and I know all of you were too in the ICUs. So with that, um, I'd like to thank everyone on this call and in the chat group for all of your support. I'd love to, we'd love to hear anything you all have felt our lessons learned. We have um, 
Chip Schreiber from my Cal, our CalMAT and DMAT teams. He's a psychologist and professor of pediatrics who's actually studying mental health um, in responders of disaster. And then Dr. Ni Chang Liang, who is a pulmon pulmonary critical care specialist at Scripps and Sanitas and is um, segueing into uh, wellness. And so I'm going to stop share and invite anybody else open forum for folks on the line if they would like to share with us and we can have an open conversation. Hi, Asha. This is Maida Sohikian from Scripps, and um, I really appreciate these, and I know a lot of my colleagues are on the, uh, on the calls every week. Um, this isn't so much of a lesson, but just wondering what people think. I've always felt that um, critical care has been the poor stepchild of the hospitalists and the cardiologists and all the other sexy uh, specialties, and, and we maybe part of that's our own fault for not doing a good job marketing ourselves. Now we've been in the forefront, maybe still a little bit of the poor stepchild, but we've been um, we've been there. I've seen more for, about emergency medicine than I have maybe about critical care, and I'm wondering if this is an opportunity for us as a as a specialty to uh, share with the world what we do. Um, I, I just that's that's just my a, a question for people, and if they feel the same. Um, yeah. This is Christian. I, I actually would say, um, and I'm speaking more actually on behalf of my entire division, I would say absolutely yes. Um, you know, within critical care and even within our hospitalist and cardiology group, we feel pretty comfortable about who we are and what we do. And we've had a lot of support from our hospitalists and cardiologists. We've gotten along well. It's been somewhat outside of that and even in administration where we've struggled. And I can give you a good example. This week, we had um, a meeting with quality and safety, which I'm sort of a part of, but uh, within a division, or excuse me, within an department level, not a hospital level. And um, they basically spent the entire meeting telling us how we need to improve our Vizian scorecard, particularly the mortality observed to expected ratio. I will tell you that my entire department um, walked out of that meeting, as did all of the critical care surgeons, because, you know, we just got our asses handed to us for about three months, and there was not a single thank you. There was no discussion about it. There was like, we're unhappy with your numbers in this last quarter, which reflected kind of where COVID was. And um, I will say that that's something um, that we need to teach some, some people within healthcare leadership. Um, you know, I do, I will say a lot of us felt like we worked hard and we kept the doors open because if we didn't come to work and we didn't show up, there was no surgery happening. There was nothing else going on because they would have been overwhelmed. So I feel like there is a good opportunity. And I don't know if other people feel the same way. Um, you can tell I get a little um, wild about it when I talk about it at times. So I'm trying to stay calm, but it's been, it's been an interesting battle at Davis with it, which I'm not shy of sharing. And sorry, I'm so negative about it, but <laughs> this was, uh, it was different this week. No, I, I just, I think it's a reality and that's, that's why. And I just thought, you know, hey, let's see what we can do to, about our specialty to share what we've done and what we've accomplished as opposed to all the people who have died on our watch. <laughs> Yeah, and Asha highlights a nice point of a lot of the wellness, no time to grieve. Um, we asked for wellness and, um, you know, which is not bad. They gave us snacks and a lunch, which is still something, but that's, we don't need food. And definitely you guys can see me on Zoom. I don't need food. Um, what I definitely need is, you know, a little bit of, um, you know, a little bit of more mental health. And I know Asha and I have mentioned this briefly, and I'd love to hear what sort of wellness support everyone else has, because I know for our group, that's been a hard a uh, hard uh, level of support we would like to have. How about other folks on the line? Um, how about anyone from Los Angeles? Hey, it's George. Well, uh, Hi, George. You know, I'm, I'm happy to be able to say that um, at least at Cedars, the, the administration has been very supportive uh, of our effort and they've done everything to make sure that we have everything we need to get to the work day on a daily basis. But they've also, um, you know, provided not only food, which is appreciated, but also provided uh, hotel rooms for a lot of our staff who were concerned about going home uh, after working in a COVID ICU and ex potentially exposing their families. You know, at the, at, at the beginning of the pandemic, not so much now, but so in terms of beginning, and I thought that was a, a nice gesture, at least by the administration, to help support people who had these concerns. But um, it's disheartening to hear that any administration, you know, would... <laughs> 
be critical of the work that anybody did. I mean, we were really had our backs up against the wall, I think. And uh, just being able to keep the doors open, I think, is a great achievement. So I, I would uh, congratulate everybody for the great work that they've done. And uh, I, I think we can hold our heads high. And I, I get the appreciation, not just from the administration, but from people out there. I, I actually took a couple of days off last week, which is why I missed the meeting last Friday. I went on a ski trip. I was skiing all by myself and I got on a chairlift with this guy, a local in Colorado who asked me what I do for a living. So I told him, and instead of jumping off the chairlift, you know, he actually uh, congratulated me and was very, very uh, thankful. And I, that, that made me feel good. You know, that made all the, all the effort uh, worthwhile. Thanks, George. Any, any other folks? Um, I can uh, make a comment, yeah. Asha, from, from UCLA. So, you know, I think that um, similar to Christian, we have been, um, I guess, disappointed with largely the C-suite and the hospital administration um, having to prod them to say thank you to the ICU docs and to the, um, the ICU nurses, for example. Um, they finally have been hearing it and they're, you know, they're now doing the right thing after about a year. Um, but, you know, I, I think um, from my standpoint, I, you know, sort of, I'm a leader in the Department of Medicine. And so for months and months, I've been at every meeting I, I go to, at every sort of speaking engagement that I have the opportunity to speak at, I, I basically talk about how the entire hospital is, should be indebted, you know, and owes a huge debt of gratitude to the Palm Quick Care physicians. And I think I've said it so many times that people are really starting to hear it. And interestingly enough, people are actually now diverting philanthropy to us, which is a big deal in LA, um, to build a very robust wellness program at UCLA. And so I've been tasked with putting together that proposal in the next couple of weeks with promise of funding something very comprehensive um, that includes mental health, integrative medicine, you know, food retreats, that kind of stuff. But I think that um, it took a lot of, um, I guess, being very vocal. I think on the national level, I think this is actually something that the organizations can do, whether it's CTS or ATS, right? If you had asked the, the general public on the street, what's an, ICE, what's an intensivist? Nobody used to know, right? And now this entire field has been brought into the spotlight. Um, you know, the, the number of intensivists that have become Twitter famous, honestly, in the last year because of COVID, um, that alone within the social media presence. And so I think this is the time for us to leverage our professional society um, connections to, to exactly highlight our specialty and how important it is. And we, we should not be second class citizens to cardiologists if that's what people feel. Thank you, Tisha. That was more of what I was speaking to. I mean, I think all of our sites have had their challenges with support, but I think uh, that's exactly the problem. Oh, you mean you're an ER doctor or you're a hospitalist or something like that, and nobody really knows what we do, and now they do, I think, and, and maybe this is a good opportunity for us to uh, do something from a society level, um, and CTS is so wonderful. Um, or from a, a national level. VG, I see your mic open. Do you have anything to add? Hi, um, I totally agree with the, all the previous speakers who have actually highlighted the need for greater advocacy on behalf of the critical care physicians. And I do think that uh, I, I work at Kaiser and I do think the organization has attempted to do the right things all along the way, including focus on wellness. It's a little hard to focus on wellness when you're drowning significantly with the volumes of patients you have. And as critical care physicians, many of us are also practicing pulmonologists. So the workload from the outpatient world has also been rather significant. Uh, but the amazing amount of support that we have received from our patients is something that I do want us uh, to actually highlight. Many of my clinic patients have been so tolerant when I had to call them later about their CT scan results and much more accepting of, of the delays and that they would not previously not have tolerated well. But at this point of time, I do think that the this is a setting where we could actually leverage the, our own presence in the hospital structures and systems, because as rightly pointed out earlier, critical care has always been the stepchild to other uh, much more vocal and stronger departments. But this COVID has highlighted the need for a, a better presence for us as critical care physicians in the hospital structure. So uh, yeah, to that end, I'm 
I'm thankful that our administrative leaders have identified the need to support us as physicians and also identified the need to support us with wellness as well. So hopefully the next few months of having a lighter load will allow us all to debrief and, and re-engage our energies and supporting each other and maybe moving forward through this process. Thanks, Arsha. Thank you. Thank um you. And it seems like we're developing a theme here, which is very important. And I see somebody's hand is raised, um, but I, it says diagnostics iPad. Yeah, sorry, I'm, I'm new to Zoom. Uh, uh, my name is David Bauer and I am a respiratory, longtime respiratory therapist at the uh, Providence Hospital in Torrance. And, um, uh, you know, uh, it's sad that it takes the COVID pandemic to have certain professions even looked at or even recognized. And, uh, and until this hit, uh, you know, many of the pulmonary doctors and other doctors that are, you know, have a more direct role to play in this, uh, maybe weren't looked at with as much respect as they should have uh, until this crisis happened. So, I mean, good and bad things have come out of this, obviously, for many different groups, and hopefully moving forward, uh, stressing the, the need for better uh, communication amongst all groups uh, working on, you know, getting people better in the hospital in general. Um, um, I, you know, I admire people that have gone and done as many things as uh, doc, Dr. Admanson. Um, he is at least, uh, I'm at least close in age to him. I'm going to be 66 here in June. And they always say, well, what are you going to, when are you going to retire, David? And I go, I don't know. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm, I think I'm in pretty good shape for, for the age of I, I am. I take care of myself. I said, I really love working with all of the, the nurses and doctors and my fellow coworkers. There's not an issue at all there. Uh, the issue is more with the bureaucratic nature of hospitals and, again, sometimes with the um, corporate mentality that we run up against. So, but I do appreciate these series that you guys have started. And I'm sorry that many times I was working and couldn't even listen in. It was very interesting. So, thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you for being a part of it. Um, it, I just have one more comment. I mean, yes. I, I think um, there's a lot of lay press about the pandemic after the pandemic, right? There's a lot of mental health data coming out that about half of physicians um, and healthcare workers impacted by the pandemic are saying on a survey that they, they do not want to continue their career the way that it is. Um, and I think what's become very evident in every single hospital as we surged was it actually isn't the number of beds in the ventilators. It's the number of RTs and ICU physicians and ICU nurses that is always a limiting factor. Um, yep. And I think that's the way to sell it. If this is the pandemic after the pandemic and you're gonna lose your cohort of RTs, ICU docs, ICU nurses, um, you know, and you have anything close to this again, you're not gonna be able to function no matter how many beds and how many ventilators and et cetera, et cetera you have. And so I think that that's the rationale to get resources for, for well-being for this group in the upcoming years. No, I agree. I, agree. I, was, I was surprised to hear on one of our calls that um, fellows are having a hard time finding jobs, pulmonary critical care fellows. I, I would think they'd be worth their weight in gold. And they are, I think, because a lot of the practices have lost money and gotten, you know, again, the irony of getting pay cuts and losing FTEs, but I, you know, I graduate eight or nine fellows every year and I've never had to help the fellows this much as I've had to help wow. them. Wow. So I think in our remaining 15 minutes, um, let's hear from Ni Ching and Chip, um, any comments, thoughts that you'd like to share with us regarding so our own PTSD or resilience? Sure, so I'm a child psychologist by training that kind of fell into disaster response 15 years ago because of a wildfire in my own community and I kind of moved to academics. Uh, although I'm also a disaster responder, so I went to I went to uh, the Miramar early on in the COVID response for NDMS, and then I've done actually telebehavioral health with some of the frontline NDMS teams. Um, specifically, uh, we got to pilot 
a follow-up effort in NDMS. They've never done anything like this before, and it's kind of off the books, and there's no data capture of any kind. There won't be any reporting officially of the, of the metrics, but we did follow up on about 75 NDMS members, physicians, nurses, also uh, paramedics that were deployed to the Southern Texas border in the middle of the summer when they had some pretty significant surge. They were going into very poorly resourced hospitals where there was maybe one of you guys for three hospitals and you know, 30 ICU patients with some number of them on vents, completely overwhelmed. And the NDMS teams, most of them are not usually trained for that kind of context, doing uh, code response. They were doing 10 codes a day, just because the, uh, the local providers were just so overwhelmed at that point, by the time the feds arrived, you know, the kind of, that's what they wanted them to do. So uh, I think the mental health aspect has been also kind of ignored. And there is now data that is showing a lot of symptom levels early on from China, it was showing um, PTS rates in the, in the high 40s. There's a difference between transitory symptoms of post-traumatic stress and actual clinical post-traumatic stress disorder, the syndrome. So there's kind of like transitory distress, there's subsyndromal presentations or kind of moderate symptoms, and then there's full-blown PTSD, but PTSD is really not a sufficient mechanism to understand what happens to, to all of us in disasters and uh, especially chronic events that continue to unfold now with the, with the whole variant business. And that is that many things happen. So when we have loss, you know, personal loss and significant loss of patients that maybe would have fared uh, differently had there been uh, resource allocation decisions and processes that were thought through uh, maybe in advance. There's also depression. And we already know that physicians are have burnout uh, in the 40, 30 to 40% range to begin with. Higher in residents, higher in interns. My daughter is now a second year pediatric resident. And, you know, she kind of got through the intern year, but interns are like the highest risk uh, burnout population kind of across all the subspecialties. And there's, uh, there's concern about an increase in their suicide rate. So there's all kinds of issues kind of uh, embedded in this. And, you know, I don't think we've given this, um, we, we have a system in LA County that's been funded for several years. I'm not saying it's the end all, it's the only approach, but it allows for providers to kind of monitor their own exposure to evidence-based risk factors over time and then access hospital-based resources or actual uh, internet, the kind of the new thing are, are we call digital interventions or internet-based interventions that are available free. And it's been hard to get hospitals to, to buy into that. Hospitals have had a big impact, like an active shooter event, they're, they're much easier to engage. So I think uh, in, in the whole, my list of risk factors is really very similar to those that Asha listed. So the moral injury, you know, facing uh, crisis standards of care, those choice points, not having uh, support from the institution and, and not having kind of processes kind of pre-identified and having to do that on the fly. Concern about exposing your own family and the implications of that. Lack of PPE, um, the, the financial impact, there's data coming now, out now on physicians by a group at Mayo that are looking at uh, some of the financial uh, issues that have occurred. So there's a variety of different things. And I think we need to think through uh, solutions to kind of each one of those pathways to risk rather than just focusing on, focusing on kind of the in state, the clinical manifestation that we do have really good treatments for, but what if we could get to this, these sets of issues much earlier in, in the sequence than we currently do? We could, you know, that would have a lot less impact on the, on the providers and their families and, and the entire healthcare system from, for that matter. Well, Sorry for thank that you. diatribe. No, thank you very much. And I think um, uh, your conclusion is a call to action. So I, it's appreciated. Ni Cheng, I have your slides if you would like to 
jump in with your thoughts? Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Ni Chang Lang. I'm an outpatient pulmonologist mostly, but I did get called in for surge a couple of times this past year, um, you know, rounding in tents, wearing fancy stormtrooper type PPE helmets, etc. Um, the moral injury and the, the level of distress that I've seen amongst healthcare professionals, and then also amongst patients, that's going to be the next pandemic. It's going to be a mental health pandemic. Um, it's been a perfect storm of the 44% burnout rate going into the pandemic. And then on top of that, the pandemic, we know from prior literature from the SARS epidemic that about 10% of the healthcare professionals were uh, diagnosed with clinical PTSD. And yet I think that's an underestimate. And after COVID, it's going to be probably much higher than that. Um, there are a couple of good articles out there already talking about this in terms of comparing burnout to PTSD and some of the different drivers along with the similarities of the drivers in terms of like, for instance, the excessive workload and lack of control. Um, and also some of the different overlap in terms of therapies as well. Next slide, please, Asha. And so we also know from the wellness literature pre-COVID that yes, individual level interventions are helpful, but not as helpful as system level interventions. So it's a it's an opportune time to think about how we as people who have been in the midst of this pandemic can be the change that we want to see. Um, this is an opportune time to advocate for our own wellness because really we can't take care of others unless we take care of ourselves. Uh, next slide. And so I like this diagram because this is what we need to set up for ourselves for success to be able to continue to thrive that we have to connect with our work and be given space to actually process the meaningful work that we are doing. The mental health resources has been a huge one because there, there is still a lot of stigmatization regarding mental health issues amongst particularly physicians and potentially quite confidential questions that were supposed to answer on medical licensing forms about our own mental health when mental health issues arose because of the profession that we chose. So next slide. And so I wanted to open it up because all of us are innately resilient and some wellness programs have been couched as you need to do more yoga or you need to do mindfulness or you need to do X, Y, and Z training on your own time in addition to everything else that you're supposed to do as a clinician. Innately, we're already very resilient going into medical school and all the training that we've done. And so I'd like to hear from all of you, like what have you done for your well-being over the last year that maybe was a little out of the ordinary for you to, to actually do for your own health and wellness. And you can like unmute yourselves or type in the chat box. I think everyone wants to keep hearing you talk. <laughs> well, I put up here like the five pillars of health as the foundation. Oh, Elon, you started playing a musical instrument. What did you start playing? Uh, guitar. So I, I've, I've wanted uh, my whole life to do it. Um, but never uh, set the time to do it. So I, I started taking my own advice. Um, uh, as you know, I've got three kids and with one of them who is an absolute superstar, you know, she's been interviewed at MIT and Yale and everything. I found myself having to tell her that she's enough. Um, you know, she kind of always felt like she's never enough. She's got to work harder and do better. And I realized that, that many of us have that same thing. So no matter how much work you do, no matter how much you give extra, 
I think many of the pulmonary critical care physicians that we work with kind of feel like they're, they're not enough and they can do another shift or they can work a few more hours. So I think that's something that, uh, that you know, some of us needed to learn how to do, which is just tell ourselves, you know, this is enough. Those, those you know, patients or emails can wait. And I'm going to sit down uh, by myself and learn how to play a G chord. Yeah, so many important points you brought up, Elon, in terms of our tendency for perfectionism going into medicine and, and critical care and pulmonary medicine and, um, and the lack of boundaries that many of us have for our own health and well-being. And so the, the five circles there represent the five pillars of health, like we lecture to our patients all the time about the pillars of health. And yet for us, the first things that go when we're busy clinically are our own pillars of health. And so I ask all of you to, especially learning all that we did from this pandemic is to really, really prioritize your pillars of health. And a reminder that they include sleep, nutrition, like eating five to nine servings of vegetables and fruits every day in a rainbow variety of colors, exercise 30 minutes of moderate intensity, ideally outside, stress reduction. It doesn't have to be yoga or mindfulness, but something that resonates with you, like Elon's guitar playing. Maybe when he gets better, <laughs> he can play for all of us. Um, and then social connection. So like we have been physically distanced, but we can still socially connect in this way to be in community in more creative ways. So like prioritizing all of those things and thinking about like, what is it that I need in this particular moment? And other people um, have chimed in also in that um, dog therapy, so like animal <laughs> pet therapy, yes. We know about music therapy and then definitely um, the National Academy of Medicine. So the ATS well-being collaborative we actually have a website um, with a lot of different resources for wellness that have been national initiatives, including the NAM um, website alongside of the AMA Steps Forward and then riding bikes. So like different activities, like I'm, I'm a paddling freak now. I paddleboard at least once or twice a week and I join my dragon boat team for kayaking on the ocean a couple times a month. So it's like finding out what you are interested in and protecting time to actually pursue those outside interests outside of work. Gardening is super therapeutic. Um, congrats, Chip, on getting the Peloton 100 ride shirt. I'm still waiting for my shirt. Um, kayaks as well. So yeah, so pursuing interests outside of work is super important. And appropriate cartoons at work. <laughs> so bringing in humor. So um, Rosemary Admondson that some of you might know from ATS, uh, she just sent me a link about bringing in improv comedy into medicine. And so stay tuned if you're gonna be at the next ATS or in a few years to ATS, we might put together an improv wellness workshop for comedy. Um, but the literature actually has already been bubbling with all of the different ways in which to help reduce burnout amongst healthcare professionals who worked in COVID. So I'm not gonna read the two lists for you, but they've already put that together. Um, and, and I've been a mindfulness teacher now for 10 plus years and I don't have as many notches on my belt as like Denny with all of his international field work, but I am a cancer survivor and um, May will be 10 years for me. And so I learned early on as a cancer survivor in my during fellowship, my second year of fellowship that I can't be of service to anyone if I can't take care of myself. Um, and so I had to prioritize my health and wellness so that I could still show up and, and basically still be on this good earth. Um, and so I wanted to share a little bit about mindfulness because mindfulness conjures up images about um, people who are in lotus posture and uh, doing fancy yoga mudras 
for instance, but really mindfulness is a state of mind that you can apply to everything, anything, anytime, doing or not doing anything. It's basically paying attention on purpose to the present moment without any judgment. And you can learn to become more mindful. It's kind of like a muscle for the brain, similar to physical exercise, like the rowing and the tennis and the Pilates that people are writing about in the chat box. Um, one aspect also that's been helpful, the three things, the, the three good things practice from Duke. So just thinking and writing about three good things that happened. So basically keeping a gratitude journal, statistically significant improvements just after 15 days of this practice. So something that all of us can incorporate into our day to day, especially during COVID. And then one of my last slides just coming up um, is I wanna leave all of you with my COVID bats. And here's my actual COVID bat. Um, I came up with this acronym to help teach the healthcare professionals and also my patients about mindful moments. So when you find yourself in a stressful, uncomfortable situation, think about a COVID bat. Breathe, like we all know how to breathe, perhaps even taking our pursed breaths that we teach our obstructive lung disease patients because we know pursed breathing <laughs> helps to stand up in airways and also to activate our vagal tone and then attend. So many of us are attending physicians here, but like, can you attend to yourself by naming the emotions that you're experiencing, noticing body sensations? We make thousands and thousands of decisions cognitively in our brains. And yet we don't provide the space or the time to actually notice what's happening in our bodies. And are you able to notice the thoughts about that difficult situation as if they were uh, clouds passing through the sky or leaves floating down a stream as opposed to getting spun into those thoughts and activating our sympathetic nervous system. And then really asking yourself, attending to your own needs, what do I need in this moment? So that you can then transition into a response as opposed to flicking into your fight or flight reaction. So just a little mnemonic that I wanna leave all of you with. Um, to take with you as we continue along this pandemic path. And uh, there's other different ways to incorporate mindfulness and um, I'll leave the slides with Asha, but even taking stethoscope breaths when you're examining patients. So breathing while you are listening to their breath sounds, taking um, the time to do some mindful hand washing because we're gelling in and gelling out and washing our hands a whole lot more, you might as well pay attention to that and enjoy your free hand massage. Um, I'm gonna be leading a mindful meditation writing practice on Sunday. Um, you can also eat mindfully. We were taught to eat when we could, pee when we could, sleep when we could in residency, but actually now taking time to actually taste and look at our food before we scarf it down like Garfield all these different things that you can you can apply very easily even just in moments of your day-to-day -day living um, and yeah the, lots of different apps have free subscriptions now to start a contemplative practice um, and we know from mindfulness literature it does help to reduce burnout um, and then over the last almost one year um, and you can go to the next slide, Asha, that um, I've been working on a couple of different grassroots projects, one called the Mindful Healthcare Collective. So we have about 2000 healthcare professionals signed up on our Facebook group over around the world. Um, and me and eight other physicians who have additional training in mindfulness and yoga and coaching we put on one to three free Zoom events every week for healthcare professionals and also the general public. And then a couple of years ago, UCSD awarded me an internal grant to professionally record one to five minute mindfulness meditations that all of you can have access to. It's freely available online. Um, and yeah, I welcome all of you to join us over at Mindful Healthcare Collective. It's free and 
for your patients, Mindful Healing Collective, because some of the yoga classes are open to the patient populations and um, happy to collaborate or dialogue with any of you about wellness on a personal or organizational level. So thanks. Thank, thank you, Ni Chang. I mean, just your voice and presentation was just so soothing and really appreciated. So thank you. And I love seeing everyone's, um, what they've shared in the chat group uh, with, to your question. And, and Chip as well, thank you for all of your reflections and uh, summarization of that it's not us, it's systemic and, and things that need to be fixed. And so we really appreciate that. And Denny and Christian, as always, um, you guys are amazing. And with that, I'd like to, I, I know everybody has been amazing staying on. We're a little bit over time and I'd like to just put up our concluding slide and uh, let you know that these sessions will still continue on, um, sorry, now everybody's gonna see everything, um, into March. And our next one will be March 12th and then followed um, in March, on March 26th. And it will be hosted by the CTS Ed Education Committee and the board. I think we may have one more uh, comment in the chat. Thank you, Chip, for being on. And we're still gonna do COVID and post-COVID rehab, steroids and other topics. I think uh, it was mentioned earlier that airway clearance. So more to follow. And so this is a trend and I think it'll be a great community. And if anything does shift or change and need surge attention, or crisis will all be here together and it will be a great forum to kick it back into gear. Uh, we thank again our supporters for this meeting and uh, encourage everyone to consider joining CTS. It's not very much um, and welcome to the fold. So you get all of this information and it seems like we've got uh, some group work to be doing uh, regarding awareness of our profession. So with that, I pass the ball to CTS and Denny and Chip, any concluding, or uh, Christian, any concluding re remarks? No, again, it's, uh, it's wonderful to see the people that stayed and, and uh, I've learned a lot uh, I, and I'm gonna try and do better. And I probably drink less scotch, all right? Yeah, thank you, Asha, for your great leadership, Denny as well, and I'm just, I'm uh, happy to be riding on both your coattails and just be a part of the process. And this has been my mental health every week. So thank you. Bye. Have a good weekend, everyone. Bye-bye. And thank you to our presenters and everyone who shared their thoughts that made this a richer conversation. Good night.